everybody, Nalani Lazowitz here in La Cunada, Flint Ridge with my Facebook partner, Rob Bastriani. Rob is Hello. in Falmouth, Massachusetts. How are you, Rob? I'm doing great, Nalani. How are you doing? Wonderful. We are now in a week or a month five almost of our Facebook page and we have over 500 members to our group <laughs> called Pickleball Noise Relief. So this thing is catching fire and, and we're so happy to be reaching out and talking to people. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you know, so when, when we got the uh, preliminary injunction in Falmouth to shut down the courts, uh, you know, it was a struggle and we didn't have enough people uh, to really get a, get a movement going. Uh, I mean, we, we, were, we barely scraped by. So what, what better way than to bring people together uh, than from all the different parts of the country. So that's where I think we've been successful here and gathering a lot of uh, momentum. And, uh, and I think we're creating a lot of, uh, a lot of talk. And, uh, and I think we're actually a presence now where we weren't four months ago. I don't think anyone was really talking about the noise uh, that much. Um, right. And uh, now they are. Yeah, yeah it, it, the, the, the main message of media for the past three years has been the fastest growing sport. People love it. They're having a great time. But you wouldn't hear uh, the consequences on the impact to the, the, the neighbors. And also, increasingly, we became aware of the impact on the tennis players themselves. And so uh, this month's call is going to be focusing on tennis and pickleball. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about a peaceful coexistence between the two sports. And on the other hand, it seems like uh, maybe they would uh, be better off being separate. And we know that uh, USTA is the governing body of the sport, has been very active in um, supporting all recreation. And we know that there's an interest in transforming recreation uh, facilities throughout the country. Both sports are growing. So we invited two experts. I'm very happy to say they're both from Southern California. Um, I wanted to thank um, basically the USTA uh, Tennis Venue Services team because they connected me with Esther Hendershot, who um, is the director of uh, community tennis here in Southern, Southern California District. Uh, she and, uh, and our friend uh, in Phoenix, Jeff Sykes, who's the marketing director of his district, uh, they recommended John Broderick as being uh, our other speaker. And John is the president of a very prestigious organization, the San Diego um, District Tennis Association. So we're thrilled to have you both. And um, I'd just like to maybe turn it over to Esther and you can uh, Tell us a little bit about what you have been finding over the past three years, the, you know, kind of what's working and what's not working in integrating these two sports. Thank you, Nalini, and thank you everybody for inviting me and inviting John. I think John is a perfect person to have on this call. Uh, he has been very helpful to this cause, not only just uh, as far as pickleball and the taking the, uh, taking over of tennis courts, but in addition to co-lining and as well as noise. So thank you, John, for uh, being a part of this. Um, here in Southern California, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the USTA National has made their statement of guidance for all of the sections. There are 17 sections in, in the United States under the umbrella of our headquarters, uh, USTA National. Uh, and they have said that the a statement of guidance, basically uh, trying to coexist. We started out coexisting with pickleball, but obviously uh, there have been a lot of issues with that coexistence. And I, a big one has been the noise. And there's been a lot of um, uh, sounds about bringing it up, but no one has really addressed it. So when Nalini came up and uh, brought this up and USTA National shared that with me, I was totally on board because I was one uh, who brought up the noise issue probably about six years ago in the city of Pasadena, uh, right up the street. Uh, prior to me becoming the director of community tennis, I ran a tennis organization in Pasadena, the tennis uh, Pasadena Tennis Association. 
which is run operated out of a Pasadena Unified School. And across the street is a, a park, the Allendale Park. And uh, unbeknownst to all of the tennis community that was using that park, uh, pickleball jumped on it. When we found out about the meeting, we went to that meeting and obviously were outnumbered. There were just two of us against a room full of people that were loud and had tambourines and had a lot of equipment to just try and drown us out. T-shirts. Yes, T-shirts. And so it was very difficult to even get our message across. Tennis is a sport of uh, sportsmanship, integrity. You know, you shake hands at after win or lose at the match. You might have some kind of an outburst out there, but ultimately it is a sport of sports, good sportsmanship. We were not seeing that in tennis. I raised that, that concern and, um, at the national level, they continue to promote coexisting. I think that many of us, I didn't feel that way, but many in the tennis community felt that it was just going to be um, some, it was going to be here temporarily. It was going to go away, but I could see that it was not going to go away. And so the more that we uh, went that pathway of, well, okay, let's just coexist because, you know, there, you know, it's going to go away. It just wasn't. Uh, we needed to hear more from UST National. And as, you know, time went on, we started to see they were taking over public parks, taking over schools, taking over any area that they could. And what was being affected were the residents that lived in surrounding areas of parks that have been there for 25, 30 years, have raised families. Um, you know, kids gone to school in the district. Suddenly you had people from outside coming into their communities, into their neighborhoods, raising a ruckus, being loud, being noisy. That's just them. That had nothing to do with pickleball. I mean, just uh, that those are the players. Then suddenly they're on the tennis court and they're not very nice. They were rude. They were hostile. They were arrogant. And um, then they started to play ten, uh, play pickleball. And then on top of their loudness uh, was the sound of pickleball. And these neighbors were saying, wait a minute here. Not only do, I, do we have to put up with these people and their rude behavior, now we're putting up with the noise that comes along with their noise. And uh, it was affecting many of the residents, many senior citizens, and they were outraged. But we discovered that cities and municipalities were not really paying attention to the concerns of the residents and at young families that were starting to move in. Mind you, many of these families, and I will say, you know, my father included, uh, who have raised families in homes, you know, they want us to live in these homes or do whatever we want in these homes. So we were part of these communities and being confronted with with these issues so it, it became a bigger concern and we started to voice our opinions during all this time attending as a representative of usta attending me uh, meetings and then you have unincorporated uh cities where there isn't a city council there's a board attending these city council meetings and board meetings the hostility continued they were not willing to listen even though we were approaching it in a very calm manner, the coexisting way of, hey, listen, we can coexist. Hey, you know, this, we can be friends. Compromise. Yes. And, and, and um, if only you join us, you'll fall in love with it too. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And in all that, then there was the issue in San Diego and John and his group said, there's no way. They were looking at losing valuable sites that have been there for many, 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 many years uh, with families that have raised their kids on these tennis courts. And then not only that, they wanted all these lines. And I started getting calls from HOAs from all over Southern California, uh, uh, senior uh, 55 and over communities where a pickleball was coming in and taking over their center courts and putting these bright yellow lines and then just changing everything. And so we started to hear more and more from, so from the USTA standpoint, from Southern California, where 
it never rains in Southern California, so to speak. We're like, uh oh, you know, this is going to be a bigger problem and it's going to be year round in Southern California, which means a lot of noise, a lot of chaos, a lot of, you know, negative energy. And um, so that's when we, we decided, hey, we need to do something else. We've been communicating with USTA National saying, we appreciate the efforts of the coexisting, but it's not working. We need to have a stronger stance. Uh, and uh, fortunately, we were told that every section is allowed to create and establish their own statement of guidance to uh, along with what they're saying. We say, okay, um, I'm not sure we can coexist. I mean, I'll, I'll allow John to speak on that, but I will say these courts that have been taken over that were supposed to be temporary courts are now six to seven years. That's not temporary. Temporary to me is one year. And so we're, we're seeing communities lose tennis courts to these loud and ruckus groups. And the noise continues. And now the neighbors that said, okay, it's temporary, thinking maybe a year. Now they're, they have this sound and this noise constantly and it's driving them crazy and they're saying wait a minute you said this was temporary and this is not and we're finding that not just in pasadena but throughout southern california and um so now we are taking a stronger stance here at uh, ust southern california and going to be putting together our own statement and john will be a part of that very good. And before we turn over to, to John, I just wanted to uh, share my screen and make sure everybody knows uh, you can see the statement of guidance here. Mm -hmm. So this is what uh -huh. um, Esther was referring to. This is a, the most recent uh, document on the UST website. They talk about the fact that both sports are growing and there's going to be a significant increase throughout the country and demand for, for both tennis and pickleball courts. So they recommend three options. You know, one is to have, and the ideal recommendation is that both sports should have their own courts. So that's number one, and it makes a lot of sense to uh, to those of us involved with this issue. Number two, non-traditional spaces. They talk about using, um, let's see, hard surface areas such as concrete slabs, multi-sport courts and parking lots turned into pickleball courts yet, but that would be really creative. I think if I owned a Home Depot, I might consider building a pickleball court in the corner of the parking lot. But what really prompted my call, my outreach to USTA is when I saw this option three, the shared use of courts. And my husband is a longtime tennis player. He plays three times a week and um, we had to fight to, uh, close a pilot of a dual use court, which uh, not only drove the neighbors crazy with the noise, the, the closest neighbor was 23 feet away, but it also was very disturbing to the tennis players themselves. So there's, there's two issues, you know, what about sharing the same court with overlapping lines? And what about playing next to each other? If you're in the big facilities and you've got six pickleball courts and and six tennis courts. So I'd like to go to that question um, and as a way of introducing John and to let us know what you've been experiencing and it's also to talk about the tournament space. Uh, sure, well, again, thanks for um, the invitation to have me address everybody here today. I appreciate that. Um, so this, just give you a little, I guess, background real quick, if that's okay. Yes, um, please do. So, so the San Diego District Tennis Association is part of the SCTA. We're funded by the SCTA, which Esther is a director of a part of that organization. She's the director of the community tennis for the SCTA, which is in part a large, I mean, a section of the USTA. So there's the USTA and then there's sections. And quite frankly, there are, are as far as I know, there really aren't many, if any, other districts left in the organizational structure of the USTA like there is in San Diego. We happen to be a very strong organization. We've just celebrated our 50th year this year. Uh, we have our own Hall of Fame. We have a lot of um, programs that we do, like the Tennis Fest every year. That's the largest free tennis clinic of its kind in the country. And we do a lot of other things um, 
that have made us a very strong organization within the SCTA over this time. Um, and it has, as it so happened, when I was asked to take over as president, it's been a little, uh, it's, it'll be, by the end of the year, be about two and a half years. And I remember when Esther and Trevor Croneman, uh, the director of the SCTA came down to San Diego in a meeting, in, and it was right before the ATP 250, a, a men's tournament, pro tournament, first one we would ever had in San Diego. And they had a, they had a meeting, kind of a get together, introductory meeting. And I remember addressing this pickleball issue then, before it really became a thing to where it was something that I talked about and I cautioned about, but we really hadn't engaged with anybody in that community at that point in time. So um, fast forward to January, the pickleball group here, this one vocal group that we've been fighting, um, had a front page article in the Union, the San Diego Union Tribune, and that gave pickleball a lot of traction, a lot of publicity. And about that same time, these these two guys who are part of this group, they had put forth a letter to the San Diego tennis community, and it was sent to me. And, and somebody called me that was friends of these two guys and said, "Hey, they want to take over this, you know, Rob Field, this Peninsula Tennis Club, the courts, the twelve courts you have there." And and, they, and their their letter said, stated that if you give us this organ, this club, we will leave the rest of San Diego tennis courts alone. Um, the other, you know, public clubs. So that was really like the moment that I kind of took it real seriously. And I said and to myself, I said, over my dead body, you're going to do that. And I, so it really sparked me to send an email out. Sure. For, for a question, SCTA, is that Southern California Tennis Association? Yes. yes. Is that correct? And so that is are... actually, uh, I'm sorry, Eleni, that's actually the of, the legal name of the USTA SoCal. It is Southern California Tennis Association, SCTA. Okay. And then um, the Rob Park that you just mentioned, was that a Rob public... Field? Yeah. Rob it's, Field is it's that a, a public, public tennis. Public tennis it course. Is. So they were asking yeah. the city of San Diego to exclusively dedicate that to pick a ball, and then they'll stop looking for courts. Well, they were specifically approaching the, the the leadership in tennis in San Diego and asking for this, the you know, blessing. yeah, this, you know, to to co to do this. And I, rem you know, I reached out immediately. I sent an email out to the to probably 250 people in the tennis community, most just a lot of different people that I knew, a lot of, and then certainly people that you know in tennis had a lot of weight over the years, some of the, the heavy, so to speak. Um, and then I just propose a question do we, do we just ignore this or do we do something about it and not be, pro, you know, um, do we be proactive here or do we just let it run its course and see what happens? And I wanted to see how people responded. I mean, I certainly had my ideas. I, I knew that we couldn't, you know, do that, but I wanted to get other people's opinions and see what everybody chimed in. So that was really the first communication to the San Diego uh, tennis community about what was happening with this particular organization. They had they had pigeon you know they had decided this is the place they were going to attack, and um, so ultimately I had heard later that this group and and a bunch of their followers were, were attending a public um, a, like a CRG meeting community community recreation group meeting, and they had like ninety some people and their tennis people had four or five kind of like what Esther is describing here they had there. And the reason you're seeing that, just so you, in case you guys aren't aware, the pickleball, you know, structure nationally has what they call ambassadors, that they go out in all these communities and they seek these ambassadors to grow the game. And they're asking, you know, these are people that don't get paid. They just go out, they're, they're passionate about the sport. They have this game plan. And what I found out from who you mentioned, Jeff Sykes, he's from the um, Southwest U uh, USTA, uh, that section. He had found that, well, actually, I don't know that I actually knew this until they ran that Brian Gumbel special about a year ago um, that's on HBO. I can't remember. It's Real Sports, I think it's called. Yep. And they, yeah. they identify, yeah, they, and I think Jeff had told me about this, but I really didn't see it published or until the guy who had been taking all of these courts over in Phoenix um, bragged about how they literally had a book on how to overcome objections and how to take over tennis courts because I knew they must have been doing this because I had heard from a lot of, gotten a lot of feedback from a lot of people that had seen what we were doing in San Diego because we had been doing interviews and, and, and 
you know, on YouTube and stuff and people were contacting me and I'm like, well, why is this message so consistent? How is, how is it possible that they're doing all these same things? Well, it turns out, well, this guy literally published a book that he's giving out to all these pickleball organizations. So I would say to everybody on this call, you know, it might not be a bad idea if, you know, and I don't have it with me, I, I can get it for you. I have my, my emails here. It's not a bad idea to have this book so that you know what you're up against and know what you're fighting and, and kind of know the tools are using um, because they certainly talk about how to overcome objections with um, parks and rec departments, with all city councils, you know, getting people on the boards, much as we've tried to do here with tennis, uh, doing the same things. And we have uh, certainly a big part of what our organizations try to do. We've had people on our, what we, we started a tennis advocacy committee uh, that became an actual committee, not just ad hoc, uh, a year ago in March, um, we had started this committee, but it wasn't really to thwart or preserve tennis courts. It was just to find new courts. And all of a sudden we had this new problem. Not only are we not able to find the courts that we want, we're trying to fend, you know, fend off all this attack on the existing courts that we had. As, as Esther will attest, I mean, we're, and all of you know, I mean, if you're into tennis, if it's not just about the noise, um, because obviously that's an issue too. Because and, and disclaimer, I I play pickleball. I I played it all over the county, um, but I I have a real problem with you know the way it's going about how they're utilizing the infrastructure of tennis to go about to do it. In addition to the issues that do come up from noise, because whenever I do play somewhere, especially Bobby Riggs, that's so the most well known organ um, facility in the county here, they're right next to you know this residential area. And I just always wondered, like, God, how do those people, I mean, with 21 courts right here, day in and day out, how do they handle that? I just know I couldn't. And, no, and, I and just, what about I, the players themselves, the tennis players being next to the pickleball players? What's the impact there? Well, that's that facility used to be all tennis. That's why it was called Bobby Riggs. And then the, uh, somebody bought it out, realized they could make more money on it. Um, and then they turned it into gradually it became nothing but pickleball. Mm. Um, but I will say this from my own experience playing, like trying to play a league match, um, at, there's a place called Pacific beach tennis club here. They have two courts that are co-lined of their, I think they have like eight or nine courts there. And when I tried to play this league match, I'm like, no, I'm not playing next to that pickleball <laughs> courts. We were three courts. I finally got them to move me three courts away. And there were certain times when I'm assuming they were all like watching a match to see who won, you know, with this group that day. But imagine trying, you know, it, between golf and tennis, golf being the, the sport that probably demands the most silence when you're trying to hit a ball. Tennis would be second in my mind of all the sports I've played in terms of concentration, mm -hmm. particularly when you're hitting a serve, even more than a ground stroke. But as you're, sir, you know, tossing a serve and you're really trying to focus on that contact, it needs to be pretty quiet for you to make to be successful at it. Uh, if you have these sudden noises, um, it's very distracting. What about the double lines? Well, I'm, when I was going to get to that. Yeah, in? yeah. I mean, certainly, as you're trying to re return a serve that's going very fast, um, even if the lines are you know so far apart, you know, I've how many times I've tried to go. Oh my God, what I double take. And in tennis, you need to make your line calls immediately. You don't have time to like sit there and you know, go look at the line, you know, and you can't do that. And so, yes, the lines on pickleball are certainly a big distraction for me as a tennis player. I, I would argue the same thing even for what USTA does with these, the junior lines, they call them blended lines. I'm not a fan of that because I've played on those before, um, but that's another issue. It, but that that issue is something we talked about in a, a week ago, Esther was on that call, about how that can be something that can be utilized if you did have blended lines for the junior tennis lines on a court, it can be a deterrent for people to try and take over courts for pickleball. So there is something good to come out of that. As a player who's not used to playing those lines, I, I certainly don't like having these other lines on there. I find it to be quite distracting. If I can add to that, Nalini, um, the USTA has, well, Southern California, we are adopting a rule that if there are any pickleball lines on a tennis court, we you cannot have a tournament. And a lot of organizations that operate out of parks and recs 
out of school sites, will find themselves out of a sanctioned tournament, which can generate substantial revenue for their, or their organization, they'll be out of luck because they now have pickleball lines. We will not be supporting um, sanctioned tournaments. We will not give sanctioned tournaments to organizations that have the pickleball lines on their tennis courts. So that is a rule that will be on our statement, making it very clear. But not only does that affect the organizations that have welcomed pickleball, because a lot of clubs and organizations feel, oh, this is, you know, we can make money off of this. Right. So it's a, it's a quick money grab. Um, but we want tennis to be tennis. And, and so we are going to, uh, you know, put that rule into our statement of guidance, but also parks and recs, whether it's uh, LA parks and recs or the county or any other municipality that have public parks, they make money off of uh, USTA or adult leagues, junior tournaments, because we use their facilities for tournaments and events. They will be out of that revenue that they are are getting uh -huh. from the and that they've had it for many, many years. So now we're telling them, listen, if this park, if your parks that we play these tournaments on have the pickleball lines, I'm sorry, unfortunately, we cannot use your site. Now, a, a lot of I will say that L.A. Parks and Recs and the L.A. County are now experiencing a lot of issues and a lot of problems with pickleball. So they are now revisiting what how they are going to move forward in uh, with the pickleball. And because of the behavior of these ambassadors and pickleball players, the fact that people that do not live in these communities are coming into these area communities where taxpaying homeowners have been there for years and now suddenly they're inundated with all these outsiders coming in, they're going to find themselves in, you know, not being able to, to do this and get, and get away with it. So, so there are a lot of things happening because the parks are realizing, Hey, listen, these are our residents. They pay taxes. They live in these communities and it's the, Pickleball noise is getting bigger and bigger. It's a complaint that is not going to go away, and I see it just uh, growing. I will say the um, national tournament that was held, I believe it was in Dallas. Melanie, correct me if I'm wrong. But um, I heard from Todd Carlson, who was for, with the uh, USTA National Office, and we met with him. Melanie and I, we met with him, and I ran into him in a conference in Florida and he grabbed me immediately and he said, oh my gosh, Esther, the biggest issue there was about the noise. Nalini and her group are absolutely right. And so they, the pickleball people were found themselves being attacked because of the noise and it's not going to go away. So it is an issue that now has Grab the attention of USTA National from the section. It's been in our radar. Now it's time for us to step up and do something about it to support our community, our tennis community, but also the residents that live in these surrounding areas and protect our junior tournaments, our adult tournaments, our junior leagues and adult leagues as well. That's so wonderful that you're stepping up. And, and I think short term, it might hurt you in a way to lose some of these uh, league play at the local parks. But in the long run, you're trying to protect your sport and grow it to the next generation. And we really are all about, uh, you know, 2024, what is going to change? So a quick question, then I want to turn it over to Rob, because I'm sure he has he has some questions as well. But do you think that on the national level, they're going to continue to provide guidance for how to do the overstriping? Because that is something that just it seems like a glaring error. USTA is not building soccer fields. They're not building basketball courts. Why are we so busy building pickleball courts? So I, I wonder if either of you have a quest, uh, an answer for that on the national level. Well, I can uh, answer it and John may, uh, may want to share something as well. From the national standpoint, the pickleball noise has resonated with them. It, it's a light bulb, boom, uh-oh, okay. So now they have to act. And now they're seeing sections 
sections applying, doing their own statement of guidance, as well as the lines, the co-lining. You know, initially we thought, oh, hey, we can coexist. But the lines are not these faded little lines. They're bright yellow and I don't know what other colors, but I have seen these bright yellow lines. There is no way I could ever play a match or even have a tournament on a court with this with these lines. It's dizzying, it's distracting, uh, and it's. I think it's intentional. So um, USTA is looking at that, and, and um, I, I believe that they are going to be revisiting their statement of guidance. Um, yes, uh, their statement says, hey, let's share, and you can have, if there are eight courts here, you can have two courts. But again, the noise factor, and I was at one of the largest junior tennis tournaments in Southern California. It's called the, the uh, junior sectionals. That's where you have the elite junior players. You have college scouts there scouting the next collegiate collegiate player from Harvard to Stanford. You've got, you know, Arizona SC, UCLA, everyone. Um, and I, I was watching a, a player that, uh, that I follow closely and right across from this match were pickleball players and it was i could not believe that they had uh, were allowing the pickleball players to play during a very important tournament for many years. it's a national tournament you had you know it's a big tournament so that that i i believe really you had complaints from parents from officials from the tournament directors and just saying, hey, this is enough. When are we gonna say, hey, we, we've got to do something. We've got to address this from the national level. I'm, you know, I know that they're hearing it and, you know, everyone's knocking on their door, pounding on their windows. And as a section, USTA, Southern California, because it very rarely rains in Southern California, we will, we will be putting together a very strong uh, position on this. John, do you want to add anything? Oh, yeah. I mean, back, uh, I think, Esther, I sent you that that memo that, that I had put out with Steve. Um, and the wording that I had used at the time was simply now that what you guys were adopting is that we we had, I, we had said that we won't allow, we won't finance any uh, court resurfacing in San Diego County if there are co-aligned pickleball courts on those courts. And we also said that... Um, if there's um, if there's co-line, we won't finance, and we won't allow any tournament play on any of those courts. Um, we have a club that somebody on this call, Aureli Udall, is on the call. She's currently it wasn't at the time, but is now the um, director of tennis at UCRC. That club had an issue with Parks and Rec. They had a they had one of the six courts there that had co-line, and against the wishes of the Parks and Rec Department, they went ahead and resurfaced over those lines. So the Parks and Rec, de, de, uh, dire, uh, rec Director was going to come out and meet with them. So I knew about the meeting. I just showed up at the meeting. I just said, look, I'm just here to observe. You know, we, we're, we're concerned because, you know, we don't we don't finance these courts if they're going to be co-lined. And we don't, you know, I told them about the tournaments. We don't do that either. It had been actually since about 10 years since we had had an adult USTA tournament, but he didn't need to know that. Um, we had planned to do it since we had a new director in there. Um, and just as a side note, when they had done this, the, the the director at the time, these pickleball players literally were were recorded cussing him. I mean, literally cussing him out, like men and women, like yelling at him, you know, cussing his name. And, and you know, so we played that for the director of Parks and Rec. And and um, anyway, they they want it, They still want us to put co lines on these courts. So I met with a group um, of there's like four other of my uh, board members. We met when the Parks and Rec had this meeting again a few months ago with the staff from UCRC. Aureli was there, and we wanted to have a presence and let them know that we didn't you know agree with that, even though we were pushing for it. And they haven't they haven't made them do that. And we did have. Now that Aureli's there, we had the first UCRC adult tournament uh, two week weekends ago that we've had in like over 10 years. Um, so, but Parks and Rec was really looking at, for this particular club, the fact that we had these, and it meant a lot to them, to at least the director of Parks and Rec, because if listening to these meetings we had, it was very important to this particular director that that wording was there because USTA National didn't have it, SCTA uh, didn't have the wording. So we made it up 
for our district. Fortunately, like I said earlier, we have a district and we're able to do things locally that maybe aren't done, you know, elsewhere that at least Parks and Rec is listening to. Right. Um, so anyway, those those are some things that um, that seem to matter down here and made a big difference from what we're doing. Otherwise, if we didn't do the things we're doing in San Diego at these clubs, honestly, I believe that we would have co-lining at many of these clubs, um, if not all of them at, at this point. I just You're don't right. see how that, that wouldn't have happened with all the pressure that was being le levied on us and all the publicity they were getting. So we actually started doing interviews. You know, I, I sought out these t this TV station I had a relationship, started doing interviews with them and taking the side, you know, so tennis had its, you know, its storyline. I think it's very important to understand trying to get public opinion in your favor and get the word out there, at least get it recorded. So when people talk about it, they hear your point of view. It's just not pickleball, pickleball, pickleball. Everything isn't just great from pickleball. There's a lot of other things. Obviously, this noise issue is a huge deal. And it is one of the issues. It is one of the reasons that this particular group is trying to take over this club because it's not really close to residential areas, and they know that. So they're really focusing on that place. But it's a club that's been around for tennis for forty years. It's been financed by tennis for forty years, and you know it's it's just something that we weren't going to we we're going to take no for an answer on. The other thing I want to comment on real quickly is if you when you talk about this coexistence issue. If what you see happening and the reason that that club didn't want them to have the, the lines on that one court is as soon as you give up a court and there you have several courts in a row. Well, I can tell you right now, the tennis players aren't going to want to play next to that court, which is what happened at UCRC. Then the pickleball people are going to say, nobody's using that court. We want that court. And that keeps happening every court in succession. And it's what's called what I call steamrolling. They steamroll these clubs and these courts over and over by this tactic. They get in one, they take another and so on and so forth. Then you lose the club, you lose the courts and, they're, and you're never gonna get them back. As soon as you give up those courts, they will never be, it's not a temporary thing. It's a permanent situation. You'll never get the traction and the leverage back. So that's why to me, I saw all that unfolding at the time and made sure that we did everything we could as an organization to fight about it, uh, fight against it. And then our concept too is at the time, because I was getting a lot of people contacting me, was to form some sort of a coalition, sort of like what you guys have done. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a very, what you're doing is very important because you can do something and have a national effect by what you're doing here. That's why I thought it was important to be on this call um, because these kind of things need to be talked about, all these issues. They need to, you need to, you know, take it, this issue about the noise to the press because in San Diego, we've got many areas that have had lawsuits. I've just played at San Diego Tennis and Racket, or just want to watch people play at San Diego Tennis and Racket Club here in San Diego. They had a lawsuit they had to go through several years ago about the pickleball. Rancho Santa Fe had that. Many of these places had these, and those plastic, you know, barriers they put up. There is a place up in Carlsbad that I play pickleball in, in Poinsettia Park. I, for the first time a few months ago, I drove down the street because I had to park so far away. I was easily 10 homes across the street, 10 homes down. I could still hear pickleball. So I can only imagine what those people that are right next to those six, there's only six courts there. But I can imagine, you know, those people that were used to not having that noise, what it must be like. Um, so it's obviously a real problem. And I know that everybody's seen these you know, they're trying to get the, the balls quieter, the paddles quieter and how they're going to manage that. But it's been this Wild West thing that just go for it, take over, you know, courts and, and everything. And um, and there's just, you know, fortunately, Esther and the SCTA have put together a task force to recognize what's happening and, you know, do what they're doing. Uh, and I don't know to what level that's being done elsewhere. I know Jeff Sykes has been dealing with this in Phoenix area for, for a long time, much longer yeah. than we have. I wanna, um, I wanna, so fortunately. I'm going to turn this over to Rob in a minute, but uh, mentioning Jeff, he does have a Facebook group called Save America's Tennis Courts, so people can go there. And I wanted to, uh, to share this document right here. Do you see the spreadsheet on your screen? Yes. Yeah. So Rob has been working um, on a calculation when we talk about the impact of, of pickleball, one of the factors or the data points that we don't talk about enough or that we don't hear in the sound studies is how many pops are happening in a given hour or in a given day. And we know that the impulsive noise is very different from ambient noise. So the number of pops is 
I think, very relevant. Can you walk us through uh, a sample, Rob, of uh, let's just take an average situation of maybe eight courts uh, open from, let's say, eight to 10 at night? You know, I mean, there's not much to the spreadsheet, but it does uh, provide a good illustration of uh, what a lot of our members deal with on a daily basis. And uh, so, look, we've got three variables, um, variable one. So how many hits are happening during a rally? Maybe you have some beginners, it's three. You know, maybe it's uh, up to 20, uh, you know, per point. Um, and then uh, variable two, how many points per game? Uh, Game goes up to 11. Maybe it's a shutout, so 11 points. Uh, maybe it's a tie, 22 points. So maybe that nominee is, you know, whatever, 17, 16. Um, right. And I understand that the number of games per hour that can be played, it, maybe every 20 minutes, every 15 minutes, uh, you can play a game. Um, let's say let's say every 20 minutes. So that'll be uh, with, with a little turnover, so we, maybe three. Three so games. we've got three. So, so you've got you've eight got, courts. I mean, if you have so, and then then it's simple with the multiplication, right? So, if you have eight courts for ten hours a day, you've got six hundred thousand hits uh, per day. So you can have an individual living near the courts being exposed to over a half a million pops, half a million percussive pops. So let's look. Um, let's look at this. Uh, this is a more uh, elementary game. So let's say ten hits for sixteen courts. Over a million it, hits yeah. in one day. So I mean, this was really helpful for me uh, when uh, I went in front of the town of Mashby, and uh, gee, for, maybe it was only for a few weeks, but we got the court shut down immediately on a Sunday. Everyone was flabbergasted by the number of hits one of our guys was uh you know the neighbor in a butter was exposed to and what, um, what we what we find almost shocking is in america we never had a sport that was active play seven days a week 14 or 10 hours a day it just hasn't happened <clears throat> you know and yet we're not the this game is not uh, exceeding the codes in many communities. And that's because the codes were mostly written in the 70s. And it, well, again, this this kind of noise never existed. Most recreational sports are intermittent. You know, they're not seven days a week all day long. So I just want to make that point. Rob, uh, no, what I direction think, would you, you know, like I mean, to? If I could go back to the point where, you know, we, uh, John, thanks. For, you know, we are allies in this, you know, and we're connected by the noise. You know, um, we recognize that uh, impulsive noise is a hazardous noise and it's coming from pickleball play. Um, it's at a it's at a decibel that's that's higher than than legally allowed. It's at an exposure level that we just discussed uh, that's unprecedented for any activity. Um, and the pitch is unique. And you guys have all heard this before, but it's unique and it draws your attention. You hear it and it turns your head every single time. Uh, well, when you're indoor, when you're inside your home, yeah. you live a few houses away from the tennis courts, the pickleball courts, and you're inside and you can hear that pickleball, there's a problem. Absolutely, absolutely, you know? Yeah. And I'd, so, you know, for instance, I'll just, so united in the noise, um, you know, we have Adventure uh, Aventura, Florida. They keep talking about, I mean, I love these guys, but they keep talking about the trees and, uh, you know, but what they, what they're really, what they could, they could really, they lost their public garden and they lost their oasis in this very uh, heavily populated suburb. And, uh, and I'm like, guys, it's the noise, it's the noise, it's the noise. You got condominiums three stories high and, uh, you know, 80 feet away, you're, you can win this on the noise. Um, and then we've got, um, we have West, West Seattle, right? Lincoln Park, 135 acres. And, uh, you know, we, we could win that on the, that could be one on the noise as well. Uh, because there is, there is a detrimental activity, you know, to the people who are enjoying nature. Who, and, uh, and there's wild raptors and uh, a variety of wildlife there. Uh, but yet they want to put pickleball courts there. 
light it up and play, you know, 12, 14 hours a day. Uh, but yes, I think it and needs then, to become an indoor sport. Actually. It needs to become an indoor sport. Uh, absolutely. You know, but you know, John, if I could get off of that real quick and just be like, how the heck did it catch you guys by surprise? Um, I mean, no offense. I mean, it caught us all by surprise. My first sign had pickle, pickleball spelled wrong. And that was a little embarrassing, but you know, um, how did it, uh, I mean, was it only January when you started talking about this, when the light bulb went no, on? No, it was only January when we had somebody actually threaten to take over these clubs in the way that, in the, in, in the manner that they had done. I had, I had, like I said, I addressed the issue, you know, seven months before when I became president right away that yep. we're, you know, we obviously, and it was, that was nothing that we didn't already know. Esther knew, I mean, every, it wasn't like, it was just something that I said, we really need to focus on this because this cannibalization of tennis courts is already happening. Um, you're seeing it at private clubs. You really can't do anything about the private clubs other than fight the noise issues that may may be, you know, prohibitive at those clubs depending on how they're where the. So it's it's a one it's not a one size fits all answer because it really depends on the relationship of the housing, and, you know, as the noise is going to be relatable. And you guys are also bringing in other things I never really thought about in terms of the environment. You know, if you're going to be in an area that you want to, you know, relax and then enjoy nature and you've got pickleball popping going on like crazy, you know, in these areas too, there's a whole other thing. I never really, I just really only looked at it from the standpoint of if you're living somewhere and you're having to endure this ongoing noise all the time, how just unbelievably bad that is for you and your and all the money and the value. Think about what property value you're losing. Um, what a huge loss to your investment, and let alone to your 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 sanity um, from all that noise going on. I mean, I as much as I enjoy playing the sport, I can certainly understand, um, you know, that that issue. And and I'm I'm with you guys. I mean, I that's why I'm on here too. I want to find out more about it. I, I mean, you guys have raised lots of questions that I never really contemplated. So I'm, I've learned a lot just by being on the Facebook page and just looking at the posts um, and just trying to educate myself and get a little more familiar with, you know, what's happening as well. Um, you know, we all, we are certainly allies here, I think, to the, for the majority of this. And um, so we help, we all have a very common interest. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, the noise thing is, is certainly no getting around it. I don't know. Even if they quiet the ball and the paddle, to what degree, I don't know. I, I think it's always going to be a thing. I, I When I think about pickleball, I'm like, yeah, that really needs to go indoors um, and focus that way rather than being outdoors would solve a lot of problems. But I want to respond to Rob. Um, I will say that, honestly, in my opinion, I work for the USTA. <laughs> I felt that USTA was a little slow in responding to the pickleball issue. Uh, and I, I again, I, I felt, I, I feel like they thought it was going to just go away or it wouldn't just explode like it has. But now that it has, it has taken the USTA, uh, I would say, uh, by surprise. And I think the noise factor, the noise side of things, as John say, I don't think people really thought about the noise until you started to hear the noise. Because when we talked about pickleball noise, we were talking about the people, the ruckus people out there. But suddenly- just, it <laughs> Well, that's part of it too, sure. Yeah, but oh. suddenly it's not just the people, it was the actual pickleball sounds From and- the, the, the plastic ball and the hard yeah. ball. Yeah. But you know, so, in, in the pickleball manifesto, they do, they talk about that, right, John? You know, what you guys are referring to. How to combat that comment, you know? And, it's, it's uh, the and sound of what, people having a great time. That's their well, right, I, and it, it is brilliant and genius. Does T, does USTA have the you know what do you call it the you know the the you know the, the conduit fortitude. to spread the word nationally? Do you guys have that, or is well, it just working on it? Sounds yeah, like. I, I sound it's like you're working on it, <laughs> well, but no. The USTA came out last April or May about the same time that the you know that. Nalani, you showed that that thing of the court. The guidance. They came out with a, a national of how to handle pickleball um, that I suppose we should copy you guys on. I, I don't have it handy, but I, Esther knows. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. There was a actually a very comprehensive, and I thought it was pretty well done because it was done by a lot of people throughout the country that donated their time and 
and their knowledge about putting this, you know, this this up. So the USTA does actually have um, a stance and wording about it. It's interesting, though, that now that they're actually piloting, you know, pickleball programs and asking sections to what if they want to do them or not, and certain sections are doing them. And it certainly makes it tough on local, I feel, that it makes it tough on us to justify, you know, what we're doing when you see these, the USTA, a tennis organization, piloting pickleball programs. You know, right. and I, I, I don't really like what I'm hearing about the reasoning behind it because they want to see how the the scoring goes or something in our system. I'm just not, I'm not a fan of that answer, but uh, it's something I can't control. It sounds but like, I, it sounds I like certainly... a strategy to me. So, right. Well, I, I will say I, this, that Southern California will not be piloting any kind of pickleball league. Uh, <laughs> with, that's with, great, uh, great to hear. Uh, that's why right, you're so I guess, have to ask I the think. question, I, uh, is tennis losing players to pickleball? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, tennis is losing players to pickleball. Tennis uh, has also gained players that have gone from one. I've seen people that have gone to go play uh, these other sports and then have come back to tennis as well. It, is there any specific figures on how many people have lost? And then there's people like me that play multiple rackets. I play padel, I play pickleball, and I play tennis, but I predominantly play tennis. I play the other two when people ask me to play and it's convenient and it's easy and I want something to do. I have, you know, the ability to, I have all the, the paddles and the balls and everything that I need. I can just go play another sport. And I, I don't feel it hurts my, the sport that I'm focusing on the most. Um, and, I, and Gary, you had a question? I actually don't have a question. I wanted to give a little bit of uh, background uh, because I think it's kind of interesting. I'm not a, I'm not really part of the tennis community. Um, so I live up in Alameda here in the Northern California across the bay from San Francisco. And two years ago, the rec community here tried to put a pickle one pickleball court or, or try to convert one tennis court into a pickleball court in a park called Washington Park, which is a pristine park up here. It has the most tennis courts, I think seven. They do have some national tournaments. And the pickleball or in the tennis community actually rallied pretty strongly and and uh and convince the rec uh, committee not to do it largely on uh, the basis of noise. Uh, now, you might view that as being a positive reaction. The negative reaction, however, is they sacrificed, as a result of that, they, they agreed to sacrifice the three courts that are 150 feet away from about nine houses. And so that's the result of the battle that I'm fighting now uh, on behalf of my, my uh, daughter and, and son-in-law. Um, so I, I, it, it, in our community, the tennis community is not our friends. They're not our allies. They're actually our adversaries because they were willing to sacrifice uh, the courts uh, in, in this particular park that my daughter is nearby uh, in lieu of giving up some of their pristine courts in Washington Park, which is much further away from residential communities. And of course, we've brought this to the attention of the rec community uh, numerous times, and they have since gone back and decided that they were going to add Washington Bark Park back into the mix in terms of deciding where they want to co convert uh, tennis courts uh, into pickleball courts. So I guess my message to this group is, uh, you know, you can't necessarily be friends to everybody, but, you know, if you're willing to sacrifice certain tennis courts to keep other tennis courts, then you're not going to be making friends with everybody. On the one hand, what you're talking about, Gary, is that we need guidelines for building any, for putting pickleball anywhere. And we are very anxious to hear the governing bodies of both sports come out with uh, realistic guidelines, including the distance to homes so that you know virtually no pickleball can be played maybe within 150 or 200 feet of, of courts of homes excuse me or if you're anything less than 500 feet you need an acoustic an analysis that's going to really be professional and, and it can let people know whether or not it's a good spot i also wanted to point out that not all pickleball players are you know meanies and uh you know bullies, if you will, we, we've all got our experiences and we, we've all seen what's been going on. It has been very aggressive. There's no doubt about that. But let me ask the tennis players, uh, the two of you, 
what can be done to make tennis satisfy some of the normal natural interests of the pickleball players. They want to be outdoors. They want sunshine. They want short games. You know, they want more skill, you know, smaller courts. What can be done to provide those benefits on normal tennis courts? What kind of programs could be set up and help people have more drop-in social activities? I would like to hear if you have any ideas about that. Well, I'll say that there are a lot of tennis organizations that do have drop-in programs. Um, we we call the, uh, there are um, the pressureless balls that we use. They're, we use them for our youth. But, you know, I have a 93-year-old dad, and he loves to play with the orange and the green dot ball because it's easier for him to hit, and, it's, and, and you play it on the shorter courts. And John mentioned the... Uh, the youth courts, the lining for the youth courts in tennis. And um, as a provider myself, before becoming director here, when I ran the programs, my dad used to comfortably play on that little court that we would set up with his brother, who is about five years younger than he. And so there are things like that that we can how do. How do. do you set but that court up on a on a regular size court? What do you have to do? It's um, I, it's well, a, a regular size court is is seventy two. Uh, feet and then the the smaller courts we have the measurements for that it's inside of that the court and it's smaller it's it's a little bit bigger than the pickleball court but it is a comfortable size it's like a mini tennis court but how do you share the courts because that sounds like overlapping lines again uh yeah well you have lines you have plastic lines uh you can use chalk uh, and, and then there are the the lines that John mentioned. So for myself, I kind of I did not want the lines on the tennis courts. So what we did is we used the chalk, you know, kind of what they use in baseball. You know, you have that roller. So we would line the courts using the chalk and then wash them off afterward. But there are things like that 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 can be done. I will say this in Southern California, I know LA Parks and Recs and the county have asked the USTA to put more tennis programming on their parks because if we don't do that then that's how pickleball you know jumps on as to what john shared you know they want to jump onto those courts the problem is there's a shortage of tennis coaches and and some uh many of the public parks need tremendous amount of of uh work done and so usta is also we're also looking at refurbishing many of the courts so there is Quite frankly, work to be done. We are looking at, at what we can do, and hopefully, we can come up with something—a solution that can, you know, prevent a lot of this that's and happening. It strikes me that tennis needs more volunteers as well, in, in the same way that we have ambassadors for pickleball, because Absolutely. a lot of the small parks. This is what we found in our area. Our city does not have a fully functioning parks department that can run programs. So you have thousands of local parks that really nobody is watching except for the residents. And um, it's, you know, so maybe we need more volunteers on a local level. How do you get those occasional local park users to realize that they have to step up and protect their facility and make it better? It, it takes work with the uh, parks and recs departments because they have their own processes and, and you know, just policies that they would. So we have to, whenever someone wants to run a program there, even with USTA, we have to make sure whoever we have on those courts goes through whatever process it's these parks and recs have applications, your live scan, background checks, all of that being done. And with the shortage of coaches, and, and then again, when you do have these coaches, they'd rather do private lessons because they can make more money rather than doing like a program at a park to keep it busy. So it, you know, it depends on the, the neighborhood, the community and the particular park site and where it's located as well. But it, these are things that we at the at USTA SoCal, we talk about on constantly. And I actually have a call with LA Parks and Recs next week to discuss some open park sites that we would like to be in and you know push the, the pickleball off to the side so that we can implement more tennis programming, which is at their request. So, right. you know. Any final words, John? They said, I appreciate you having 
this forum for people to get a better grasp of what's happening. And I think you want to keep it going. I guess my my final thought would be keep this rolling and keep it going and try and build it, uh, this coalition in a bigger way so that um, y- y- people are going to have ideas to – this is how you get ambassadors for tennis or for at least for to fight, you know, the, the noise thing, get ambassadors to understand what's happening in their local community. Because you have so many different rules in every city and every county and every parks and rec department. It's important to understand what those are so that you can have, you know, good arguments when you go to these city, city council meetings and the CRG meetings that you're going to need to attend to do anything about these issues. You need and you need to find people that are thinking like you that have the same issues and organize you, you know, hopefully people here, if you're here for a reason, you're sort of a leader by being here and, you know, you need to step up and, and take the time and it's, it'll be worth your while. You'll feel good about it. I mean, you know, if you have the time to do it, it's worthwhile because if you don't do anything, you're going to have, you know, all these problems that we're all concerned about you're running rampant even more. So my husband is a passionate tennis player. So I'm going to call on him as the last question here, Bob, you want to, um, hi, John and Esther. You uh, mentioned, Esther, a uh, guidance, statement of guidance about the overlapping lines for tournament play. And John, you mentioned how distracting it was to be next to a pickleball court. Could the USTA also include in a statement of guidance that a, a tournament play could not take, uh, you couldn't have pickleball on adjoining courts within 100 feet or 150 feet uh, for, of tournament play? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. After that experience of of watching top players playing very important matches and you had pickleball noise right behind them, uh, there is just no way that that we can have that, uh, you know, happen. But uh, you're absolutely right. And that will be included in our statement. Thank you so much. Rob, any last uh, comments? You know, you guys summed it up so well, and, and your words will go beyond our 12 people here. You know, know that. Um, and, uh, you know, it's about the noise and it's about uh, connectivity. It's about everybody communicating. And, you know, this is the start. Thank you. Very yeah, we much. really appreciate your time. Um, I'm going to stop the recording and we'll say goodbye to our other guests. But thanks again, and we'll see you uh, soon. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us.